Great. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Phil Sang Yu from Tsinghua University, who's going to tell us about twisted S duality. Over to you, Phil. Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so as I said earlier, like uh, it's a pity that I, I cannot be there in person. Uh, you know, it would have been the my first chance to visit India, but maybe next time. So today uh, I'm going to talk about this topic of twisted S duality. So anything I'm going to talk about, uh, any original part is a joint work with uh, Surya Raghavendran, uh, who is a PhD student in like Perimeter Institute slash University of Toronto. So uh, the relevance to the, this workshop uh, can be summarized in this way. So we are developing this framework called uh, Twisted S duality. And in particular, uh, by this, we obtain a purely algebraic way of uh, describing this physics relevant for the Durham geometry Langlands correspondence. So geometry Langlands correspondence is an algebraic statement, um, but like the physics way, namely the one uh, proposed by Kapos Witten is of course the usual physics, which is non-algebraic. And for that reason, you know, there has been a little bit of kind of the uh, confusion about how to think of, think of this uh, in math community, which is these days getting kind of the understood, but uh, Anyway, our framework in particular gives uh, an algebraic way to understand this uh, correspondence. <clears throat> and furthermore, uh, in particular, it gives new infinitely many pairs of uh, deformations of four equal four theory. So explaining how we can get things like this, uh, that's the goal of this talk. On the other hand, um, I mean, this is kind of the the main work is about just developing a framework and like an hour is actually not really like enough to explain the entire framework. So today I'm going to focus on really the simpler part, um, basically trying to give translation for parts of string theory for mathematicians. And then I write, I will write P for physics and M for mathematics, just to, you know, just so that if you're a mathematician, P is not necessarily understandable, but that's fine. That, that's the kind of whole point and vice versa. Okay, this is the plan. So let me start. Okay, so I, I want to start with uh, what we actually have done. So the claim is that uh, we do understand s of a small sector of type 2b supergravity. And it is really small sector. Uh, in particular, there is no, what is called the actual dilaton. And for physicists, this would look kind of, I don't know, boring because it means, uh, for example, there's no coupling constant, like there's no like usual string, strong weak coupling duality, which is as duality is supposed to be. Uh, on the other hand, I claim that this simplification is kind of enough to get statement like the Langlands correspondence or yeah, a lot, a lot of things. And this, this way of getting jump Langlands is much simpler than say what Kapus and Witten suggested by this simplification. And then it is purely algebraic. So it has virtues. Uh, and mathematically speaking, we certainly get a lot of kind of the old conjectures and new conjectures of GRT. So I think it's quite fitting for this workshop. But getting conjectures is actually not, not exactly our main point. Like we, we wanted to make a framework. And that does give, I mean, we, we actually have a definition of actuality and then we understand what it is. So for example, you know, uh, in Sam's talk, my understanding is that he talked about this as you know, twisted version for like for the N4 and this three N4. Uh, that is also a consequence of this framework. I mean, of course, like that was known to physicists all along, but in particular, we also obtained that as well. And much more general subs as well. But most importantly, I, I think of this work as just a setting a framework, as I uh, said before. Okay. But I want to emphasize once again that I, I don't really, you know, I'm trained as a mathematician. I don't really know this, you know, what is usually called string theory. This is just my attempt uh, with a collaborator to understand a little bit of string theory. But turns out that's kind of enough to uh, give mathematicians interesting stuff. I mean, just as always, uh, you know, physics, physics always has something interesting to tell, tell us mathematicians. Okay, so this slide is just a summary of uh, what do you expect to see in type to be super string theory? And the entire slide, again, as I said, is not supposed to be understandable to mathematicians. The point of this rest of the talk is to explain uh, what this means for mathematicians. 
So super string theory uh, is something living on 10 manifold. B brain gauge theory, you think of 2K dimensional uh, sub manifold, which is called the 2K minus one brains. Uh, and this, whenever you think of these sub manifolds, you, you have uh, field theory called the four n equal four, in the case of B3 brains. Uh, in the case of B5 brains, you get 60 n equal one comma one super young theory. Closed string field theory is just way of understanding this uh, type of dispersed string theory, uh, just as a field theory living on M10. Supergravity is low energy limit of closed string field theory. Uh, there is something called open closed coupling. Um, it, it means that if you have a closed string state, it does give a deformation of the uh, this deep ring case theory. And then type two dispersed for string theory is kind of a special in the sense that it does admit this SL2 C symmetry or S theory. Okay. And the natural question is how can we actually understand this mathematically? And the answer is uh, that it is indeed the case. And the goal is, as I said, to explain this point. Okay. And the way I want to address this is to use. <clears throat> And at least for today's talk, the main part is going to be using a framework of TQFT. And my understanding again is that Claudia gave a talk on this, so I'll be rather brief. So the dimensional TQFT is a functor, and we care about two-dimensional TQFT. And it is known that it is classified by a commutative flow in this algebra, what you assign to circle. And I want to think of this as a baby version of topological string theory, where what you assign to S1, which is a commutative provenance algebra by this theorem is understood as the space of closed string states. So here it is called closed because S1, I, I want to think of this as closed string. Then the natural question is, can you see an open string, namely an inner verb? And that leads to the notion of extended 2D TKFT, 2D TKFT which is also discussed uh, in Claudius talk. The idea is just kind of to go further down to dimension zero. In this case, uh, the target category can be understood PG category. Then uh, <clears throat> theorem of uh, Costello, Hopkins, Lurie, and Lurie. In the case of Lurie, actually, it works for arbitrary dimension. Uh, extended to the TKFT is determined by what is called the Calabial category, which is what you assign to a point. Just like the previous slide, what you assign to S1 determines everything. Here, what you assign to a point. Uh, which is not just random PG category, but Calabial category. Actually, it does determine everything of the theory. And here, <clears throat> important thing is again, the physical interpretation. Uh, this category is understood as category of boundary conditions. And this hump space between one boundary to another boundary, you should think of uh, open interval whose one end is at uh, B1, uh, the other end is B2. And I'm saying, I'm reading of that as uh, the space of open string states from B1 to B2. Okay, so from now on, when I say topological string theory, I do mean uh, such a two dimensional extended TKFT determined by Calabria 5 category. I put quotation mark because uh, for, for technical reasons, like uh, this Calabria dimension can be changed. Uh, if you're like more careful, but for today's talk, let's just assume that uh, we work with Calabria 5 category. So uh, if you don't know what that means, let me just kind of uh, give examples. Understanding examples is going to be enough. And actually you don't even need to understand all the examples. Only one example is important, which is the B model. So let X be a Calabria 5 form with a holomorphic volume form. Uh, then there are two very famous examples called A model and B model in the context of say near symmetry. And what you assign to point, which is Calabria category, one is a version of Calabria category and the other is category of coherent sheaves. By the way, uh, by default is everything is derived. So this notation may mean just uh, derived category of coherent sheaves. Uh, right. And I said that once you know what you assign to a point that determines everything about your theory. So in particular, you should know what you assign to S1. And uh, it is known that that is actually Hochschild homology. And Hochschild homology of Foucault category is quantum homology. Hochschild homology of uh, uh, coherent sheaves is known to be polyvector fields. So for us, only the right-hand side 
is important. The left hand side you can safely ignore. So right hand side we, we need to understand. So let me say a few more words about these polyvector fields. So PVX is a direct sum of PVIJ, where PVIJ is uh, of this form. So sections of uh, I space power of the holomorphic tangent bundle, and then tensor beta Dolbo complex. And of course, you have this there bar operator there. That's polyvector fields for us. Um, so th this is just description of this table. And independent of that, I, I just want to introduce another notion, which is going to be used later. I just want to note that uh, this having this polymorphic volume form, you can identify PBIJ with the omega d minus i comma j, right? This just has a, a some kind of the multivector, and if you pair in with the holomorphic volume form, of course, you are going to have d minus one form part left. But then because this omega, this is just kind of the, you know, Dolbo complex or Hodge complex, you have another operator, which is there. You can transfer this that operator to the left-hand side, namely polyvector fields, which does give uh, such an operator. By abusive notation, I still denote it by there. Okay. And so summary so far is that uh, in the scary slide, say for mathematicians, I said to be type to be string theory is something. Uh, for mathematicians, I'm just saying that whenever you hear that word, you can just think of Calabria five category. That's my dictionary. And the example is, of course, coherent shifts on X5 or Fukai category of cotangent model of something, tensor coherent shifts on X3. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now, um, I want to describe some other theories, but for that, I, I want to introduce just a way of understanding field theory, um, which is called the BV formalism. So classical field theory is described by, you know, specifying a space and manifold, space of fields and action functional. And a BV formalism, uh, is a way of encoding this information uh, in a slightly different way. So if you have this section functional, <clears throat> uh, where this phi lives, that's uh, this E, and you have this differential and this uh, uh, L2 operator, and that is just uh, all, all the information there is. So instead of formally trying to understand this one, let me just give two examples. So what is called a free scalar field theory, uh, this is, looks like that. And I'm saying that the in, entire information can be just encoded by writing down the three things. Namely, this is the my, uh, minus one shift in space, this E, and Q, differential, and L2. So here, this minus one shift is impacted thing, uh, if you're not, not actually familiar, it, it's not too important to follow this talk, but uh, the claim here is that if you have smooth function on the first slot here and smooth function on the second slot here, uh, that's where uh, you, you have this kind of the pairing. And the pairing is uh, of degree minus one because the first one is in degree one, degree zero, the second one is degree one. Uh, so in order to get lambda into degree zero, the pairing should be of degree minus one. That's what it means. And trans Simon theory, it is like it's exactly of the same form as the, the, my, our model form. Here, this is encoded by my differential D uh, and the Lie bracket just given by the wedge pairing for the form part and the Lie bracket of the other part. And again, <clears throat> degree, degree uh, minus one simplicity pairing here means that here degree zero part of this uh, complex is one form. Degree one part is degree, uh, homological degree two form. Homological degree one is two form. So that's you know how, how you pair things up. One form and two form uh, pair up to get three forms and then you, you can integrate to get a uh, number. So that's the sense in which this is the minus one. Same for zero form and uh, three form, um, which is in degree minus one and two respectively. So the pairing itself is of degree minus one. 
So upshot of this slide is that uh, from now on, I'm just going to be writing this E, which I claim is minus one shift symplectic. And then like a QML2 is just understood in a natural way because uh, I'm going to be seeing something like a drum complex or like turbo complex where the differential is natural. And I'm going to be also seeing uh, Lie algebra. So it is also natural what kind of Lie bracket I'm thinking of. So from now on, whenever you see something like this, like this E, uh, I'm going to be thinking of that as field theory, describing field theory. Uh, just, just to be absolutely correct, uh, I, I, I want to add this remark that sometimes it is necessary to work with a C2 gradient setting, but again, like a, that's not really important for today's talk. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, now I, I want to give a translation for this notion of deep brain gauge theory, of string theory. So physicists would say that open strings ending on brains on brains B, uh, that's what is uh, deep brain gauge theory. But if you want to understand what that means, uh, that's self-ext of the, this brain. Okay, if you remember like uh, my interpretation of how to think of this to the extent of TKFT, uh, this physics just becomes that. But then this work of uh, Brav and Dykerhoff actually understood this as uh, shifted tangent complex of moduli of objects. If you are not familiar with this moduli object, that's also fine. Like what we are actually going to be using is this one. Although kind of conceptually speaking, this is a good, good way to think about stuff. Okay, so summary, B brain gauge theory on 2K dimensional uh, submanifold. Just think of this object B, say whose support is on this submanifold and think of the self and the morphism. Uh, that's my, my field theory. And this category being DG category or Clavia category, that's actually giving the structure set we want. <clears throat> Again, instead of trying to explain uh, how, how this actually formally works, let me give examples. So first of all, if my category was uh, coherent shapes on C5, um, and think of the D3 brains, so I'm thinking of these three brains. So it should be four manifold. And uh, in this kind of the coherent shift on C5, the four manifold you can consider is just a C2 sitting inside C4. Then uh, this algorithm is saying that you need to compute self and the morphism of this C2 inside of the category of coherent shift on C5. And if you know sort of the causal resolution, you need to consider this normal bundle normal bundle of C2 inside of C5, uh, which is going to have an odd, odd kind of the degree. So that's why you are going to see this expression. So essentially this is, you know, resolution of the functions on C2. C2 is self you see, and the normal direction you, you see instead of the odd direction, which is epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three. So just by computing uh, self and the morphism of C2 instead of C5, you get this, expression. The claim is that this does have uh, information uh, of field theory, at least according to the formalism. Namely, <clears throat> this has natural shift is simplectic pairing uh, together with the uh, bracket and so on. I mean, of course, like you, you need to have, if you consider n these three brains, then and the morphism of n, n of them, you need to tensor with the GLN. And then it does have induced the uh, Lie bracket. I just didn't write it because, uh, because of lack of space, but uh, hopefully that, that's fine. But <clears throat> again, if you remember the, the, the scary slide, uh, what I said here, what I said there is that in type 2B string theory, if you consider these three brains, then you're expected to see uh, for the anchor four theory, living on these D3 brains. What we have been doing is to consider a simplified version of uh, this string theory, type to be string theory. So of course, what you are going to see is uh, for the integral four theory, but simplified version thereof. And indeed it is the case. Uh, we get this thing that's by computation. And I'm saying that this is actually what is known as the holomorphic twist of Fourier integral four theory. Some simplified version of the Fourier integral four. So let's run another example on the right-hand side. 
let's say I consider Fukai category R4 tensor coherent shifts on C3. And Fukai category, okay, maybe I need one fact about Fukai category, which is that an object is Lagrangian. So you actually need to consider R2 inside of R4. Right in the, in the left-hand side, I could have considered like a, just a, like a point or C, C2, C3, C4, C5. But on the Fukai category side, uh, the brains should be on R2, as opposed to say like R1, R3, or R0, or R4. And then you need to have this, uh, you can have other arbitrary powers of C, but because it's D3, it should be four-dimensional. That's why I'm thinking of R2 times C inside of R4 times C3. If you come to compute the self x, uh, okay, self x of in the Fukai category just becomes strong complex. Um, and C, C inside of C3, if you apply the same logic, you still see the C part just uh, without change, but you have now two normal directions. So that's why you are seeing two kind of the uh, odd degree. And again, because you are considering these three brains, you should expect to see 4 the equal 4 theory. And indeed, this is another kind of simplified version of the 4 the equal 4 theory called the holomorphic topological twist. So this dictionary uh, seems to be working out pretty well so far. Any questions so far? I don't see any in the chat at the moment. Uh, I had a quick question actually. So you sure. described uh, these uh, topological string theories from the world shape point of view, right? As uh, given mm -hmm. by extended 2D theories. But in your first slide, you had string field theory, which lives mm -hmm. on 10 is... Uh, so we are, we are getting there. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like uh, that scary slide, I'm going to talk about every single uh, the bullet point uh, and I'm going to roll like one by one. Awesome, great. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. That was, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so I can move on. Exactly. See? <laughs> Cross string field theory. Uh, right, so I said that what you assign to S1 should be understood as space of closed string, state, closed string states. But if you actually listen to what did you say, like more closely, they are not just thinking of what you assign to S1. Um, they, they say that because it's coupled with gravity theory, it should, it should be invariant of the diffeomorphism group. But in this topological setting, that just means that you, you think of S1 invariance of the what you assign to S1. But mathematicians know that object pretty well. Namely, this absolute homology has natural S1 action. Uh, this is what is called the B operator. And S1 invariance, that's like the cyclic kind of the object. And indeed, <coughs> there is this uh, yet um published work of uh, Brav and Rosenblum says that uh, minus one shifted tangent complex of this moduli Calabria category is realized as a cyclic co-chain shift by one. Again, this is just kind of the, like a fancy language. Uh, uh, again, if you want to have conceptual understanding, I, I think this is like really the conceptual understanding uh, one can have about this theory. But for today's talk, I, I can just be kind of the uh, work with the examples. But just, just for the summary, I can say that when people say closed string field theory, <coughs> you just think of the corresponding Calabria 5 category and compute, say, cyclic co chains, shift, shift by two. But this is not exactly fitting in the framework of the, the usual BB formalism. Uh, it has some degenerate structure. So that, that should be understood in, in the framework of uh, my work with Dylan Boston to deal with kind of the Poisson degenerate BB theory. But once it's done, then it can actually be understood as closed string field theory. Okay, for today's talk, uh, we only care about one example, which is uh, what is called the Kodaira Spencer gravity theory or BCB theory. Okay, so let's see how it, how it goes. <clears throat> let's see the category of coherent shapes on X5. And I think of what you assign to S1. That's what I need to. And I said that that's just kind of poly vector fields. And this S1 action, namely the on B operator, is a stale operator. That's why I introduced stale operator earlier, although that was not needed uh, at that slide. In other words, if I want to take S1 invariance, that's, that's what I need to do to get uh, closed string field theory. Uh, that should be this corner up there. Or uh, if you're more kind of derived minded, just like, I mean, what you do in the, like some, some setting like an equivariant homology, 
you can think of model just adding this t parameter, say of degree two, and then differential is just their bar plus t there. <clears throat> so this model is what I'm going to take today. So B C of theory on X. Uh, this is closed string field theory just by following this algorithm. Okay. Okay. Now <clears throat> I need to say something about supergravity. Um, the supergravity is again what physicists would be saying is that it is a low energy limit of the closed string field theory without any kind of non perturbative effects or non propagating fields. So mathematically, you should, you should just kind of the, think of this as a propagating or dynamic part of the uh, this closed string field theory, which is again uh, defined in the framework. <clears throat> but hard to kind of explain conceptually like now. So instead, I, I just want to give an example uh, because of, we only care about this BCOB theory for today's talk. So the dynamic fields of BCOB theory can be identified uh, in this manner. This is just formula. Uh, before I, I was thinking of the, all the polyvector fields with the, all the Taylor series of T uh, with like the bar plus T del operator. But now this I plus K is uh, limited by this expression. So again, just to be concrete, let me let me give a concrete example, which is actually the relevant example for, for today's talk. If I think of the polyvector fields, I mean, uh, BCOB theory on, on Calabria 3, 4, which is uh, like this, then BCOB theory just would be PV0, PV1, TPV0, PV2, TPV1 star, T square PV0, PV3, TPV2 star, and so on. So you, you are going to be having this uh, other term as well, but you, you just kind of uh, ignore this thing. You also have like TPV0, TPV1, and all these kind of the T powers. <clears throat> you ignore all these things, which are what is known as a background field, and you only consider the small part. That's the point of this minimal BCOB theory. Okay. Any question about this? Okay. Otherwise, I can I can move on. Um, so so far, what I have done is I have given a dictionary of uh, you know topological string string theory to topological string theory and de Bruijn gauge theory string field theory and supergravity. And then I have given the kind of the relevant examples uh, in the cases that we care about. And one other thing I need to explain is this coupling of closed string field theory and deep brain case theory. And that is given by uh, such a map. In fact, an infinity map, but you don't really care about that too much today. So physically, physicists should understand this uh, sense that when, when you have a closed string state, that does give a deformation of deep brain case theory. Um, I'm saying that mathematically, so physicists would just say that kind of sentence and they have like a good idea about what they mean. But I'm saying that in this topological setting, as a mathematician, uh, we can make it like precise in the following manner. Namely, closed string state is just an element of the cyclic coachings. And deformation of deep engaged theory, whatever it is, deformations of such a thing is uh, described by, governed by cyclic coachings of that thing. So in a sense, it's kind of tautological if you actually believe the uh, sort of my dictionary. Okay, let me, let me explain this in examples. It's a little hard to describe this um, map in an you know, alien thinking map, but for, for today's purpose, let me just describe this map uh, after taking cohomology. And I'm not going to talk about cyclic coachings, like everything is S1 invariant, so I'm going to describe at the level of uh, actual cohomology. So in the case when C is coherent shifts on C5, actual cohomology is given by polyvector fields on C5.
And this set endomorphism uh, is given by uh, this thing. That's what, I, what, what we learned a few slides ago. Now you just need to take Huxley cohomology. But now if you record HKR theorem, it identifies Huxley cohomology with the polyvector fields. So here you have C5. Here you have basically like a C2 slash C3. Maybe slash three means uh, you have three odd variables. What you are going to see here looks like kind of the uh, polyvector fields in these variables. Here are polyvector fields in these five variables. Here it's polyvector fields in the five variables where the other three are these epsilons. Now, zi is their zi. They, they don't change. So it's identity at that part. The claim is that it's wj and del wj, which is kind of a transversal to this zi, which was responsible for this giving these epsilon i's. Uh, it, the map is uh, free at transform there. So wj becomes del epsilon j, del wj becomes epsilon j. Uh, so close open map, it may seem like pretty scary, but at the end of the day, at least after this simplification, it just becomes Fourier transform. And I claim that it is essentially the same on the right-hand side. Again, the setting we considered before, you, you need to consider uh, O of C, one slash two, one for this C, a slash two for this two odd variable, epsilon one, epsilon two. In the same manner, there is a map from polyvector fields on C3 to this actual cohomology. Again, Z part is identity, but you have two transversal direction uh, of C inside of C3, namely WJ, which in turn were responsible for uh, epsilon J's. There, the map is just a free transform. WJ becomes del epsilon J, del WJ becomes epsilon J. I think this is maybe the most uh, I don't know, technical slide of, of the talk. So any, any question? I don't see any in the chat. If someone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Okay, otherwise I can uh, keep, yeah. keep going on. Okay. So I have given the translation for uh, uh, this uh, coupling as well. So now I want to give a uh, translation for the S duality. For that, I want to introduce a modification of this BCOB theory. So if you remember, my minimal BCOB theory was a PV zero star and this thing, and then I had a PV two star, starting with the PV two star, I have like T PV one, T square PV zero. I'm replacing the last term by this TV3 star. <clears throat> and then like obviously like uh, this modified one uh, has a map to uh, the minimal BCOP just, just because there's a map from here to TV2 star. And, and this also has some interpretation in terms of like Ramon Ramon forms, you know, introducing potential for Ramon Ramon field strengths but not, not, not so important for it to face time. And now I, I want to introduce S duality. So S duality refers to here, having an action of SL2C. So the claim is that at the minimal BCOB theory, we can write down SL2C action. And at the level of cohomology, this is actually pretty simple. So this is kind of the, what I wrote down, PV zero star, PV three star, and then there is a, something in the middle. <clears throat> I'm saying that if you're given an element of PV zero star, just by pairing with the uh, uh, inverse of the holomorphic volume form, you get element of PV three. If you start with the uh, element of uh, PV three, again, just by pairing with uh, this holomorphic volume form up to sign, you get just PV zero. So it looks really hard to simple in this manner. That's the s map after taking homology, which is all we need for, for applications later. Um, I want to say a few words about 
why this is a reasonable definition. So for that, I, I want to explain where this SLT come from. So for physicists, at least one way to think of this SLT is, is the following. S duality, it is an SL2Z action on type 2D string theory, but it is known that this type 2D string theory is equivalent to type 2A under P duality, and type 2A is known to be equivalent to M theory by some reduction. So that's what I'm writing here. M stands for M theory, 2A stands for type 2A. Reduction is an equivalence uh, that is known equivalence, uh, known in the sense that physicists believe um, that the circle reduction of M theory should be equivalent to type 2A theory. And that this T is just changing this S1 to this S1, just change the radius. And then this SL2Z action here is just about the, this torus. And being a torus, of course, it does have SL2Z action. But because these are all equivalents, once you have this SL2Z action, you should kind of transfer this SL2Z, should be able to transfer this action to uh, action back to type 2B. That's kind of one way to understand the origin of this SL2Z action uh, for physicists. And uh, one of our main results is that this diagram, we can basically just find this diagram uh, in this twisted state. So I didn't actually explain what this twisted actually, twisting actually means. Uh, it is a little hard to explain um, like with any kind of a visible detail. Um, you can just think of that as a simplification, just as we have been doing. So type 2B, I, I was thinking of topological string. So you may have thought that this is just kind of, a, I just kind of make a guesswork of the thinking of category and that things just like nicely working out. But there is a little more to it. There is a actual mathematical procedure uh, of making sense of uh, some parts of uh, string theory, especially supergravity. And then there is a mathematical procedure you can actually do for the twisting of supergravity. <clears throat> and in that sense, all these things uh, can be made sense of. And then we actually find this kind of equivalence between those things at the level of this. Uh, twisted setting. And then SL2Z action on the M theory is just the action of the torus. So of course you understand. And then we check that the SL2Z action we found on the previous slide, which is about type, on the type 2B, it is actually compatible with the, the action on the torus. So that's kind of the, I don't know, kind of evidence that our SL2Z action is the SDLT the physicists talk about. Any question? None in the chat at the moment. Okay. Um, so, so far, what have I done? So I said, so I, I just kind of the, basically gave a, a translation for the scary slide, right? So, and then I said that S duality can also be understood in this setting, uh, a version of BCOB theory. But in the very first slide, I said that uh, my goal is to understand what it says about uh, deeper engaged theories, the formations of deeper engaged theory. Um, and for that, I'm going to be using the translation that I, I have explained, namely close open map together with this map from the modified minimal BCOB to BCOB. And then that is actually going to be giving S duality of these deformations of uh, deep brain gauge theory. So again, let me be more uh, concrete. Let's fix my category to be this square category on R, R4, tensor coherent shifts on C3. And just as before, I am thinking of N D3 brains on this particular background, R2 times C, sitting inside R4 times C3. Because, I mean, as I said earlier, if I think of N of them, because I'm thinking of self-endomorphism, I'm going to be getting GLN. And I'm saying that this is describing a field theory, at least in this DB formalism. And I said, this is what is known as holomorphic topological twist of 
uh, for the unequal four theory. Now, what I want to do is the following: play this this game. Uh, I, 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 we understand this phi map, essentially from the identity or everywhere else and the del map for the PV3 to PV2 and uh, this closed open map, which is uh, a Fourier transform, identity like a somewhere, but a Fourier transform for, for like non-trivial part. That's kind of what we have uh, explained before. And I, I'm going to play the following game. So here in the, Modify minimal DCOB theory, there is this S section. So if I pick an element of this modified DCOB theory and hit, hit it with S, I, I will get another element. So now I'm having two different elements. But under this composition, it's going to be giving two different elements here in cyclic cochains, namely two different deformations. But because they are coming from S your elements at the level of uh, closed string field theory, they should be giving S your deformations. That's the logic. And now I want to run this thing with three examples, three simplest examples, namely polynomial of degree one, polynomial of like two different polynomials of degree two. And then we are going to kind of recover some conjecture, known conjectures, and then like I'll see some new conjecture. That, that's the plan now. Any question about the story here? So I have a question, but I don't know if it's uh, quick enough for you, you to stop now. Like, what's the reason for picking Fukaya of R4 tensor coherent sheaves in C3? Is there uh, a quick explanation for that? So, 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 I mean, again, kind of the, the that, I mean, se several kind of the reasons. So first of all, it is not absolutely necessary for the story to work out. Um, you can you could have considered say coherent sheaves on C five. Okay, uh, let's see. In principle, you could have considered coherent sheaves on C five. Um, but then the S duality map I described doesn't work. It was only for the polyvector fields on C three. So it. It requires additional analysis, uh, which we have an idea of, but didn't write down. So that's the reason, one reason. Another reason is that this particular case is what's relevant to say geometry Langlands and like related, related topic. On the other hand, this C5 example, that kind of thing is actually seems to be relevant to the s which gives uh, say this MNOP conjecture, like no Witten, Donald Thomas kind of invariant kind of the correspondence. It seems like that's coming out of that particular case. I mean, we have kind of the kind of eyeball like what's what's going to happen there, without like the checking details. It looks like that kind of thing can be uh, derived from uh, our formalism if we, if our formalism applied in that case. I see. But another question you could have asked here is that why not say Fukai category R two times uh, tensor C coherence on C four? So that kind of question also makes sense, and that actually like requires slightly different answer, <clears throat> which is that. Um, if, if kind of the, if you notice, I, I only talked about coherent shifts C5 and R4 tensor coherent shifts on C3, not the other example. The reason is that Fukai category in R2 tensor coherent shifts on C4 is not realizable from type 2B string theory because uh, type 2B string theory is known to have the 2K minus one brains as opposed to the 2K brains. So D3 brains, D5 brains, things make sense but not like D2 brains, D4 brains. If you had Fukai category in R2, uh, you need to consider R as a Lagrangian submanifold there. So R times some complex manifold. Of course, it is going to be odd dimension, which cannot be realized as a sort of a D brain uh, on type 2B. So that's the reason, I mean, so the reason why we don't consider uh, coherence on C5 is because we didn't kind of study it like well enough, but Fukai category R2 tensor coherence of C4, that is just not, not the setting where you expect to see uh, S duality. I see. Great, thanks. That was great. Really great. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Let's, uh, let's see how it works in examples. So, first example, 
I just consider W1. So I have one element, W1. I apply S duality. If you remember S duality, uh, it was really simple. Just kind of the uh, wedge with the uh, inverse of the you know, Coulombic volume form. Your know, Coulombic volume form is of course del Z, del W1, del W2. If you apply phi, it's identity here, it's del there. And then close open map, it was just a Fourier transform like this. That's what I explained before. And now we, we, we want to see how, how, how these deformations, what these deformations do this, my holomorphic topological twist. <clears throat> so here, this globalization process is kind of the, my earlier work with Chris Elliott, where the initial, I mean, our whole kind of purpose was try to understand uh, like Durham geometry Langlands from something like Kapos Witten theory. And we have globalized things in algebraic way and then getting kind of the, kind of the Durami uh, version. And now this paper of mine with the Surya is trying to give final piece, which is uh, understand S duality. Because my work with Chris, uh, we, we set up kind of the algebraic framework for like equations motion and like uh, quantization and so on, but not the SDR part. And now we are trying to understand this S duality, which is the topic of this, this paper. So after, after some work, uh, this holomorphic topological twist can be understood in this global form in terms of what is called the AKSC formalism. So it's mapping set from the drum stack of sigma to one shifty cotangent bundle of the Higgs moduli. And this is uh, AKSC description of the B model with the target being in the Higgs moduli space. Um, and in, in this globalization process, this epsilon one is responsible for cotangent bundle, epsilon two is kind of responsible for why I'm considering this, why I'm getting kind of a Higgs motion line. So this actually is a kind of technical work. I can explain more after the talk, but that's just a result of the earlier work. And the claim is that uh, this deformation, these two deformations, they are giving B model with a target being what is called the drum cycle bungee and B model with a target flat G motion line. And if you do kind of categorify geometric quantization, uh, it, it gets, it keeps the Durham geometry Langlands correspondence. And in, in fact, we also get quantum geometry Langlands correspondence in this manner. And this is just like, because like we don't have like tau parameter, the coupling constant uh, of four then equal four, which is like, I mean, you, you may think that's like defect, it's a bug, but we, we seem to be getting like all these things like in a much simpler way without ever considering kind of the say differential geometry. It's like everything is algebraic and things are just like totally fine. <clears throat> so it's kind of quite, quite a bit simpler approach to getting geometry lines. Okay, another example. Uh, if you consider configuration of D brains, say K, D5 brains and N, D3 brains um, like this. D5 brains is kind of the supported on six dimensional thing. I'm kind of done denoting those by X. These are just kind of coordinate directions of the 10. And the four, these three planes are here. And here, if I had considered uh, ZW2, ZW2 as an element of this uh, modified minimum BCOP, under this composition, it becomes this particular deformation. And this deformation is known to give uh, full D churn Simon theory. And, and that, that is actually known earlier by work of uh, Kevin Costello and Junior Yagi. And that is because uh, this Z del epsilon two, uh, which is acting this part, is essentially kind of the localizing the complex to the zero set of Z. I mean, if you think about how, how like what would be the corner of this thing, you can easily convince yourself that that would be localized at z equals three, z equals zero. So the five brain theory, which was living on this six dimensional theory, now after turning on this differential, which is a deformation coming from this particular thing, that would be living on the four dimension like this, because this part is just kind of collapsed by this deformation. But in this four dimensional thing, oh, sorry, in this four dimensional thing, there is one dimensional intersection with these three brains. That is going to be the D5 
defect, one dimensional defect. And it is known that uh, sort of the algebra of operators living on this one dimensional defect is uh, some truncated Yangian of GLK. Um, on the other hand, there is another context where it is known to be giving some kind of the, uh, such a truncated Yangian, which is 3D equal 4 theory. The claim is that uh, in, in this way, if you apply S to your to this configuration, then the phi brain is known to be giving kind of LS phi brains and it, it does give some kind of configuration. <clears throat> and that configuration is known to be giving uh, truncated Yangian as well. So two different appearances of truncated Yangian can now be understood as an example of uh, S-duality in our setting in this second simplest case. Okay, a final example. Now let's start with uh, W1, W2. <clears throat> Note that W, W and Z play different role because Z is uh, the, the direction that's relevant to the living on this kind of the brain. Uh, W1, W2, SGLT gives this element. Now, if you compute this composition, you get this particular <coughs> deformation. Here, again, you, you compute things and you get particular deformation. Now, you understand what this first deformation does. Uh, this deformation is that because this is essentially just Clifford algebra, you get this endomorphism of the C11, C1 slash one. So this, it does deform this uh, holomorphic topological twist to this thing. And this thing is exactly what is known as 4D Schoen Simon theory, except that my gauge group is now supergroup GSN slash N. Okay. And it is known that the category of line defects uh, is modules over some quantum algebra. On the other hand, this deformation, uh, which is giving particular deformation of this thing, here, this, this thing, before the deformation, it is known that the category of boundary condition is coherent shifts on the Higgs moduli. This element pi gives a particular deformation. The claim here is that uh, if you believe this, then this category of line operators should be acting on the category of boundary conditions, like in general for any theory. And if you identify this statement and believe this sexuality, there should be on kind of the hacker like action of this monoidal category of line defects on this category of boundary conditions. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Phil. So that's all. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Questions? I see Ashwin has a question. Ashwin, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Phil. Thank, thank mm -hmm. you for the talk. So, uh, can you say a bit more about uh, the coupling constant thing again? I didn't fully sort of understand. So, in the holomorphic topological twist, mm -hmm. uh, you get a family of theories that still depend on some parameter, but that parameter is not related to the coupling constant somehow. Right. So, so it's like think about the, the, the following case. So, if you think of the sort of the 62 0 theory, the M5 brain theory, mm -hmm. it does admit the holomorphic topological twist, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, and, and then you do the reduction along the torus, which is the topological direction. Uh -huh. Because it's to torus in topological direction, you, you'd end up with a 4D twist of 4D equal 4, which is actually Kaposin twist, holomorphic topological twist. But the, the reduction oh, okay. is along the torus direction. So that, that torus direction is, uh, is not going to give anything about your, your top. So that's essentially the setting we are, uh, we are getting from this construction. So the complex structure of that torus does not matter. Right, it doesn't, doesn't like appear. But without it, somehow like things are like much simpler. I see. And then you get like a, or, or the like John Klangland statement that, I don't know, at least the, the, the Durham John Klangland statement, like a, Jim Klangla's experts would care about things can be 
it seems like they can be recovered in, in this simpler setting <coughs> with only algebraic toolkits. I see. And uh, so is the simplicity because uh, the sort of dependence on the complex structure of the geometric Langlands Riemann surface sort of more natively built into the framework? I mean, where is the origin of the simplicity? Uh, I mean, the, the simplicity is, I mean, if you think about like Kapos Newton, like they, they have like a psi parameter, which is kind of combination of the, like, say, T and like a tau. Yeah. yeah. There's no tau. Mm -hmm. And like basically here, like a, the only parameter is actually linear combination of these two different deformations, W1 and this thing. Mm -hmm. And like the coordinate of this like transparent, like uh, the ratio of this uh, linear combination is the P1 for us. And it just acts as a exchanging this with each other. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the P1 that you need to consider is much simpler because without tau, it's just like essentially just something like a T, but just like a ratio of this linear combination. And this is just kind of the, uh, basically we consider the space of arbitrary deformations and these two particular points, which are coming from say twists, um, have nice, uh, form a nice P1 family. And this action is really nice in, under this setting of where you don't see it, like actual dilemma. Okay. And the, the thing like uh, we see this complex structure of C that's, that's kind of the, actually different from this work. That, that is actually the work of uh, my work with uh, Chris Elio. So th that part is slightly different. I see, I see. Yeah. So two, two non-trivial claims were made and like one is uh, this work, one is earlier work. Okay. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> Other questions? Ashwin, do you still have a question? Or? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I can ask something actually as a follow-up. Uh, so uh, just to understand the statement about the complex structure of C. Uh, so, uh, so one of the confusing things in Kapustin and Witten is they say it's a TQFT, but on the other hand, after you pick boundary conditions and so on, uh, maybe in some situations you do have some dependence on the complex structure of C and so on. So uh, is that the part that sort of, um, clearer in this framework, uh, like in your uh, paper with Chris? Yes, uh, so that, that's the thing kind of that we explain in, in the work with Chris. So I, I'm happy to explain this, uh, but maybe I should answer questions relevant to this talk first. If yeah, we're sure. getting there. Yeah. yeah, If there is any other, yeah. but otherwise I, I, I'm happy to. I do have a question, but I don't, um, maybe wait to see if others have questions. Um, Anyone has questions, please raise your hand. <clears throat> or type it in the chat box if you prefer. Maybe I can go ahead and ask my question while we wait. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you go back to the slide where you had the statement about uh, the SL2Z action on twisted M theory and... Yeah, so, so here, are you saying there's a precise mathematical definition of what you mean by twisted M theory? And that you can actually check, or is it at some level of you know uh, more heuristic level that? So control? so so okay. So this theorem makes sense because we believe some conjectures of what the twisted M theory should be, twisted two A should be, twisted two B should be. We believe the conjectures. I mean, like we actually had to modify like a little bit of conjectures, um, but there were conjectures. Uh, M theory part. I mean, 2A and 2B, I think is, it is essentially due to uh, Costello and Lee. M theory is essentially due to Costello, although we had to do some kind of the work. Um, <clears throat> but also I should say that, although they, they, they call these like twisted M theory and twisted string theory, uh, maybe more precise thing to say is twisted kind of the 11D supergravity or 11D and 10D, 2D supergravity and so on, because uh, I don't think it actually sees sort of some sort of M theory. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was such a thing. That's the first thing I, I want to say. On the other hand, now, uh, like 
very recent work, I, I don't think it's like even like a month or maybe like two weeks ago, some papers uh, appeared on archive, uh, which is identifying, starting with type 2b supergravity, how you get uh, this twisted supergravity, starting with a like M theory, I mean 11d supergravity, and how you get twisted M, M, twisted 11d supergravity uh, by following this procedure. The work is like a, the, the first one is with, I think by Brian Williams and uh, Ingmar Saberi. And the second one is kind of the uh, Richard Eager and his collaborator. <clears throat> so it is like, I mean like, okay, sorry. I think they discuss at the level of free theory, but that's already a quite, quite a bit of fit. Uh, it's pretty non-trivial. The conjecture seems pretty legit. I see. You're saying they prove the conjecture in this case, or? They prove the conjecture of identifying twisting of supergravity at the free theory level. So no interaction. That's oh. like really hard part. Yeah. Uh, but even for the free theory, it's non-trivial and then they check those conjectures. I see. So, so what kind of an object is this twisted M theory? Um, ah. Yeah, what kind of mathematical? Right, so I mean, it is just like, I mean, it is just like a BB theory. It's, it's not like, uh, not much more difficult. You can just write down sort of action functional and so on. Okay, great. I see. So it's, it's within this uh, Costello's BB formulation. <clears throat> right, right, right. I mean, so for twisted M theory, I think you can like uh, look at, for, for this particular one, I think you can just look at the, my, my periodic theory. I think that's already in the first version. It is like written now. Is that already online? Yeah, I mean, the first, I mean, basically we've been work, working on the second version for like, like, I don't know, two years or something now, by now. Uh, first version, I think that that much, I think first version already has it. Oh, great. Other questions? I had another question. Um, so you talked about closed uh, um, string field theory, how to formalize that. Mm -hmm. um, what about open string field theory? Oh, great. So open string field theory like, uh, is like what is actually called the deep brain gaze theory. So that's just the, the naming. So open string field theory is just kind of the things that you would consider in the string theory setting when you have open, string, open strings. Uh -huh. But uh, open strings uh, would give field theory once you fix deep brains. So by thinking of, kind of the self fixed, uh, you get deep brain gaze theory. That's actually like what's usually called the open string field theory. I see. And so is everything, so I, I guess my question is, I mean, I, I, my understanding that string field theory is a very hard thing to define and work with. So is it all so simple here because it's topologically twisted? Is it, or, or um, I mean, string field theory is difficult thing to work with, which is a true statement. Like closed string field theory, this BCU theory is like a beast. It's just yeah. like a really difficult thing to work with. Um, but open string field theory, just as a field theory, is just like any other theory. It's not necessarily more difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, kind of the, in conjunction with closed string field theory, how, how, to quanti how to do quantization in a way compatible to closed string field theory, and that, that sort of thing is like difficult. But as a field theory, open string field theory is just deep ring gauge theory. And in this topological setting, that is, that is like not difficult. I mean, even in the physical string theory, like you just get like four equal four, whatever. So depending on some kind of the, some, some, some brains give like difficult theories, like NS5 brains, like M5 brains, those give like uh, theories which are inaccessible to describe. Mm -hmm. But D brains, physicists know like in and out about that. Right. And also, I guess uh, everything that's accessible through this BB formalism is only perturbative stuff, right? So. You you that's, can't go beyond perturbation. That, that's correct. So, so I mean, you can you can do something that looks non-perturbative uh, by hand, but not from first principles. I would say. Right. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Phil Sang again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>